my folks, just to reassure you, you're in the right place. Um, and uh, we're just waiting for uh, the last few folk to join. We're about two minutes from, from takeoff, according to my watch. So um, stay where you are and we'll start properly just in a couple of minutes. Hello folks and a very warm welcome to this, the third session of the BTO Virtual Conference 2021. You're all very welcome. This is the first of our daytime sessions. We had sessions in the evenings on Monday and Tuesday on the wonderful project at NEP and then yesterday night on Songbirds. But today, as you can see, the theme is waders and that's very appropriate. If you've been looking at the news today or monitoring our social media, you'll have seen the release of the latest birds of conservation concern and several of our wader species are on there notably curly which is the subject of the first talks so i'm sure you'll all be interested to hear what our speakers today have got to say on this subject we're sorry of course that we can't be with you uh, in swanwick face to face which is where we would uh, where and how we would normally hold our annual conference but obviously with the the pandemic we're having to uh, connect with you in this way and there are upsides of course we've got folk from throughout the uk and indeed around the world connecting with us today and you're all very very welcome regardless of whether this is your first time connecting to a, a bto conference session or you're uh, an old hand we've got three uh, fantastic talks lined up for you today uh, and you'll be able to ask questions using the Q and A function. So if you haven't used this before, if you uh, wiggle it with your mouse, you'll find a little button at the bottom, Q and A. You can type your questions in there, or you can have a look to see what other people have asked, and you can upvote with a sort of thumbs up to give greater prominence to uh, particular questions. I'll then chair a Q and A with each of the, the speakers at the end of their talks. I should introduce myself, shouldn't I? I'm Ben Darville. I'm Head of Development and Engagement for BTO's country offices in Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland. And I'm going to be the, the session chair, the host for today. The talks that we've got lined up for you this week are really showcasing the work of our scientists, our volunteers and, and other organisations. And this programme is only possible thanks to the amazing support that you all give to us in a whole range of ways. I know many of you help us through volunteering in different ways, and we are, of course, really, really grateful for that help. And some of you also choose to support us financially, and huge thanks for that. This is, as you know, a difficult time for, for many people, charities included, as a result of the pandemic. 
and support from uh, donations, from memberships and so on, make up nearly half of BTO's income and really allows us to do what we do. So if you are able to dip into your pockets and, and support us, uh, in, in, if you've enjoyed the conference and you feel like you want to contribute in that way, then you can see there's a, a web address there on screen, bto.org forward slash support. Uh, and you can donate and help to support our priority work. And we'd be really, really grateful for any additional support, uh, no matter how much or how little. Now, many of you I know already support us also through membership. BTO is a membership organization and uh, many thanks to those of you who do. If you aren't yet a member and it's something you might consider, um, do give it some thought, have a look on our website. Uh, we warmly welcome any and every new member to the organization. Uh, and so you would be uh, really, really welcome if you chose to join us and we'd be very, very grateful. Okay, I think that's probably enough preamble from me. And we're going to move on to our first speaker, who is Sam Franks, as you saw on screen there at the start. Sam is a senior research ecologist with BTO and is going to tell us about a really fantastic and inspiring project, Head Starting Curlews. If you don't know what head starting means, Sam will uh, explain all. So I'm going to hand over to Sam now. Thanks, Sam. Hi everyone, and thanks for coming along. I'm staggered that there's creeping up towards almost a hundred of you turning in today. So as Ben mentioned today, I'm going to speak about head starting as a conservation tool for Eurasian curlew and what we've learned after five years of conducting head starting. So the UK hosts the largest breeding population of the species in Europe, um, about 20 to 25% of the global population. But the UK's population is also one of the most quickly declining populations in Europe. And there's lots of information to su suggest that poor breeding success is the reason behind decline. So that's both nest and chick losses. And there's various conservation tools which are being employed around the country, many of which I'm sure you might have heard plenty about before, especially if you've tuned into one of my talks before, including habitat management, nest fencing, predator management and so on. But in this talk, we're going to examine one in particular, which you might not have heard as much about, and that is head starting. So what is head starting? It's the process of removing eggs from a wild population and then rearing the eggs and or the chicks in captivity and then putting those chicks back into the wild population. It's a technique that's been largely pioneered by Wildfowl and Westlands Trust, WWT. And some of the notable head started species they've been involved with include cranes, godwits in the fens as part of Project Godwit, and spoonbilled sandpipers in Russia. So why head start waders as a conservation technique? Well, say you've got um, this hypothetical breeding population of curlew, where females would typically lay a clutch of four eggs. In a stable population, you might expect um, about 0.4 to 0.6 fledglings per breeding pair per year to hatch from those four eggs. But in many of the UK's populations where breeding success has been quantified, fledging success is much, much lower, about half that, between 0.2 and 0.3 fledglings per pair per year. And so much less than what's needed for stability. But if you then take those four eggs into captivity and rear them, from previous experience of head starting, we might expect you to then be able to release about 3.2 fledglings per clutch. And that's a massive increase in per capita productivity, particularly compared to that very low breeding success seen in many of the UK's populations. So when might you want to head start waders? This is some sort of example hypothetical modeling work that's been undertaken by Jeff Hilton, shown up there in the right-hand corner from WWT to demonstrate a couple of different scenarios. So head starting is most likely to have a significant benefit where you implement it in a quite small and isolated population. So that's quite key. So this graph shows um, a hypothetical example of a declining cur curly population starting off at about 40 pairs. And by the time head starting is implemented, the population has got down to about 20 pairs and head starting is implemented during this period highlighted in yellow on the graph. And if head starting, that head starting is implemented, it boosts the population size back up to a level where there's more time to address other issues. And so this is kind of a buying time type of scenario. It's also useful in the context of a small and stable or very slowly increasing native population where the use of head starting for that same period of five years, shown again in yellow, can really be used to kickstart the population size substantially over what its natural trajectory it would be. So those are just a couple of different examples. 
So given the huge per capita impact on productivity, why wouldn't we head start anywhere? Well, there's a few reasons. So firstly, it's quite expensive. It requires a lot of staff resource and training as well as a lot of specialist equipment in order to have good success. It can be difficult. It requires a not insubstantial amount of agricultural skill to undertake successfully. It can be risky in that literally all of your eggs are in one basket. So for example, if you get a predator incursion breaking into your rearing pen, you can have complete project failure. And there are also unintended risks. So unintended consequences, for example, um, you might introduce um, disease accidentally to the recipient population, for example. And finally, the numbers which you can head start are limited because of the resource that's required to rear more than say um, a few tens or at most maybe about a hundred per project that starts to become prohibitive over that. So there are currently four head starting projects ongoing in the UK and each of them have their own rationale for head starting and different le lessons learned from their outcomes so far, which I'll go through. And we'll visit all of these projects in turn, starting with the two which are led by WWT in the Southwest and then ending with the one that BTO is more closely involved with. So the first of WWT's project is in the Severn Vale. This is a slowly declining population of about 35 pairs which nests in floodplain hay meadows. And it's WWT's core curly recovery site. So that's where they test an array of interventions, one of which is head starting. And head starting was undertaken here in 2019. Dartmoor is a slightly different situation. It's a historic hotspot, but it has a now almost extirpated population of between sort of two and four pairs. But the remaining pairs that are there are in a habitat that's not very suitable and is quite difficult to manage. Whereas a few miles away, there's a former site where curlews have recently disappeared, which has much better potential for controlling the actual habitat management. And so the rationale for head starting in Dartmoor is to repopulate a former site in habitat, which is now managed appropriately. So what has happened so far from these two projects? Well, in the Severn Vale, there's just been a single year of head starting releases with fairly high fledging success so far, about over just over 90%. And the birds which have been recited during the non-breeding season have moved down to estuaries in Southwest England, which is what you would expect from this uh, population in the wild. And survival so far to now what is the third calendar year has been quite good. So similar what you'd expect from wild juveniles. But thus far, there's been little um, observed recruitment to the target population so far. And 2021 was the first year where recruitment was expected. Um, curlew take two years to reach breeding maturity. So 2021 is when they would have first been expected to return to the Severn Vale to breed. Uh, only a single head started bird was detected breeding locally this year, while two others were seen in other breeding populations. On Dartmoor, um, 2021 was the first year of the project, first year of releases, and they had sort of re quite reasonable fledging success of 80%. And so far, um, well, it's quite early days, there have been indications that birds have started to move to appropriate coastal locations. So what have we learned so far from these two projects? Mainly it's from uh, the 2019 season in the Severn Vale, because obviously we don't have a lot of returns yet from Dartmoor. It seems like curlew can be reared in captivity with similarly high success rates to other waders. They do broadly as you might expect after their release compared to wild reared juveniles. So they move to estuarine habitats for the non-breeding season, which is good. <laughs> and so far uh, it looks like, at least for the 2019 birds, it looks like their survival to breeding age is similar to their wild counterparts. And we would expect that to be about 40%. But the big question mark is natal phylopatry. So how likely young birds are to be come back to breed to their natal site um, and how many of them will actually recruit to themselves breed successfully in the breeding population that is still a really big unknown. The next head starting project we'll visit is Carry the Country in Shropshire and the Welsh borders. And this project is led by Mandy Perkins with Tony Cross, who many of you probably know from BTO conferences, delivering the work on the ground. And this work is hosted um, by DWCT. So um, monitoring in the first year's project of about 40 or so pairs showed that very, very few nests made it to hatch with no chicks at all surviving to fledge. And about three quarters of nests failed due to predation, either during the egg stage or if nests did, su did successfully hatch, predated as chicks. And these are mainly mammalian predation incidents. 
And nests and chicks in this area, uh, in addition to the mammalian predation factor, are also vulnerable to losses from accidental agricultural disturbance. And so overall, there's very, very poor productivity largely behind the declines of this population. So in 2017, Curlew applied for the first license in the UK to Head Start Curlew. And they kind of did partial head starting. So they removed eggs and incubated them artificially and placed dummy eggs into the nest and then returned those eggs which were in captivity back into the nest at the pipping stage. So just as chicks were hatching. Unfortunately though, all the chicks that um, did actually hatch from those nests were then lost. At the same time, Curlew Country was trying to um, improve natural nest success as well with measures that included rewarding farmers for crop losses when they delivered some support for breeding curlew and also undertaking lethal fox control. So in 2018, this was their first year of full head starting, so both incubating the eggs and also then rearing the chicks in captivity. But they had quite inexperienced and unskilled staff using quite rudimentary equipment, and so they only were able to fledge 21 chicks. In 2019, they got a big leg up from WWT, who provided resources for the project, including both staff and equipment. And as a consequence of this, the egg to hatch rate improved considerably with 33 chicks released. And obviously in 2020, everyone knows, no fieldwork. Um, but then in 2021, they had one member, main member of staff, part of that core of trained um, staff from 2019, working with a team of volunteers, including trainees and were able to release 34 chicks, so on par with 2019. So in total, 94 chicks have been released uh, for this project, and so far five have returned to breed within the landscape and two near to um, the study landscape. So we get a bit of a better idea about natal phylopatry from this project. So some of the key findings from this project. Firstly, they very much taken the view that some birds are better than no birds. So, they recognize that both farmer compensation and predator control are needed in the longer term to support the viability of this population, but those aren't available widely across the area until the new agri-environment scheme comes online in a couple of years. And so head starting is the only method right now to do something about productivity. In addition to the benefit of actually getting some more birds out into the population, there are other benefits, including um, in terms of community and stakeholder motivation. So a lot of the farmers and supporters of this project, you know, they really lose heart year after year with poor breeding success and nests and chicks lost for one reason or another. And so head starting can give the hope and motivation to continue. And then finally, while avicultural skills and knowledge and the right equipment are really essential for really good success, skills can be taught and exist in those who already have experience of rearing birds. So the next and final project I'll introduce you to is the Norfolk project, which is a large partnership led by Natural England with many partners, and is the one that BTO are most closely involved with. So many of you might remember Harry Ewing, who spoke at last year's BTO conference about his PhD, which is a joint project between the UVA and BTO investigating the Breckland curly population. So this is his population here in Breckland, and the Norfolk Head Starting Project extends Harry's study area northwards into West Norfolk on the east shore of the Wash, and where there is an isolated, small, and apparently declining breeding population of between two and five pairs, so shown here in the blue circle. And this map shows the proposed release location in West Norfolk bordering the east shore of the Wash, with the blue circle showing that small existing local curly population, and then these orange circles showing the two proposed release sites. So the rationale for this project is a little bit different from the other ones I've described so far. And in Norfolk, it was primarily as what is a result of a licensing decision. So many of you might have heard about this project recently. Airfields, particularly military airfields throughout the UK, provide really ideal curly breeding habitat in what's largely an arable landscape. And so unsurprisingly, a lot of air bases have populations of breeding curly. However, because of their large size, adult curlew pose a risk to military aircraft. And so historically, Natural England has permitted the destruction of the eggs on air bases that request a license for flight safety reasons. However, head starting does present a viable conservation alternative to egg destruction. And so in 2019, Natural England in partnership with the RAF and with WWT trialed the removal of eggs from five airfields in the east of England into captivity at WWT at Slimbridge. And so this is the project in the Severn Vale that I mentioned at the beginning, it's where they got their eggs. In 2021, the project was expanded to include more airfields. 
However, releases this time were also undertaken into an area with a very small existing breeding population in the local area, so back into the Norfolk population, extending that Breckland population northwards. So about 150 eggs were collected from airfields um, in total. Uh, 106 of those went to the Norfolk project and 41 of those were sent to the Dartmoor project. And those 106 eggs collected for the Norfolk project were taken to Pensthorpe, where the absolutely incredible avicultural team there um, raised them, put the eggs in incubators until hatch, and then raised the chicks indoors under heat lamps for about a week before they were transferred to an outdoor aviary. And they're in this aviary until between the ages of about 20 and 35 or so days old. They have these little houses with heat lamps provided for them to shelter in in poor weather. And they're separated into these pens based loosely on age. And then shortly before they can fly, the chicks are then transferred to the flight pen next door at Penstorp, which you can kind of see in the background of this video. And this is when BTO staff arrive to ring and measure the chicks and also apply uniquely coded color flags, which are unique to each individual. And here you can see an example on this chick walking through the front of the frame, an example of one of those leg flags. And the chicks are in this flight pen at Pensthorpe for about another week or two until they're 45 to 50 days old, and at which point they get transferred to their release site. So we expected 50 eggs for this project this year, and the facilities were built with that in mind. But it was a really good season for eggs on airfields, and we in fact had double the number of eggs. And overall, of those 106 eggs, 87 of them hatched with um, lower success in later clutches. So I think that was due to reduced fertility in later clutches. The two release sites used this year were on the Sandringham and Ken Hill estates, which, as you saw on the map earlier, they're not actually very far apart in distance, but they're actually quite different in habitat. So Sandringham is embedded in a more arable landscape, while the Ken Hill release pen is in a, on their more recently improved fresh marsh. So after they get transferred to the release site, all the birds were measured and weighed again, and then a subset were uh, tagged by BTO, either with a radio tag or by a GPS tag before going into the release pen. And the birds stay in the release pen for about a week before then finally being released into the wild when they're about 55 or 60 days old. Now, the individual color flags are the primary way which we can um, conduct post-release monitoring of these birds and they allow sightings of them to be made post-release. So in this photo taken by one of my friends, you can see a juvenile head started bird in the center of the image, this more browny, browny young curlew with some wild adult birds surrounding it in the background. However, the radio and the GPS tags provide an extra level um, of information on the behavior and movements of birds post-release. And so far the radio tags have been particularly helpful in telling us about local mortality, which we probably wouldn't have detected otherwise and have led us to predated birds like this one. GPS tags have given us in-depth information on how young birds introduced into a novel landscape, explore and move around. And this is one of my favorite parts of this project. We were only able to trial a few tags this year, but they've really shown us some fascinating information. So this is a bird tagged at Sandringham. You can see in the first week or so, it stayed really close to the release site before it started to make some big exploratory movements out into the wash. And then it hung out in the mouth of the ooze for a little while before shooting over beyond the Neen to spend some time on the salt marsh over towards Lincolnshire. And then this bird is actually still going now. It's over on the Frampton salt marsh where it has been since the end of August. So in terms of this project, the success rate was a little bit lower, about 75%, um, which we think is possibly due to this lower fertility rate in later clutches that were collected. And so far, non-breeding movements have been from in and around the local estuary. And 22% of individuals have been recited so far. We only have one distant sighting away from the wash on the X in Devon. And there's 10% mortality that we know of currently. So I mentioned that we had twice as many eggs as expected. And so it's likely that overcrowding might have reduced success rate. It certainly caused some issues to do with feather development like shown in this bird. And so far the recitings of marked birds show that juveniles often can occupy different habitats to adults. So they often, and on the wash anyway, stay in more terrestrial habitats compared to adults, which are more so in the estuarine habitats. And the tags, especially the radio tags, were pretty useful at improving our detection of mortality. So of the 10 dead birds that we've been able to identify so far, eight of those were wearing either a GPS or radio tag.
And the GPS tags have given us insight into how birds explore their landscape in the days, weeks and months post release. So as you can see, the current projects have really quite different rationales for head starting. Most are using it as a tool alongside other conservation and interventions like habitat and predator management to buy time for a local declining population. There's quite variable levels of expertise between the projects from the kind of bells and whistles approach of WWT and Pensthorpe to the more rough and ready approach of Curlew Country, which uses the resources that are available to it and then supplements that with training from experts. The real big unknown that we have as to the success of head starting as a tool for Curly is the extent of local recruitment. And so, you know, if the aim is to boost a local population, but local recruitment turns out to be low, this might not serve the aims of many projects. And it could be quite different between different landscapes. So this is really something we're going to expect to learn more about in the coming years. And then finally, it could be that released juveniles behave differently to local adults um, occupying different habitats for up to a month or so, but is that really different than wild juveniles? That's also something we need to learn. There is an awful lot of interest in Head Start and Curlew, but it's important to keep in mind, and this kind of key message is that it's just one tool in the conservation toolbox. So you also need to have a plan in place to implement other measures like habitat and predator management. Also, I would like to stress that comprehensive post-relief monitoring is really, really vital to be able to assess the success of head starting. So we need to know how well birds survive, how they behave compared to their wild counterparts, and whether they recruit locally. And various of the partners involved in head starting are working to put together a guidance document, a handbook for head starting, if you like, which can be used as a framework for projects by both applicants and also licensing bodies. So I'd just like to thank um, quite a lot of the people involved in this project um, and all of these different projects. Head Starting is definitely very, very resource intensive and there's been loads of really dedicated people who have been helping in all of these different projects. I'd just like to end with a short clip from a film made about the Norfolk project, which you can find in full on the BTO's YouTube channel. And I think really nicely summarizes the conservation hope posed by Head Starting. The next release site was on the nearby Ken Hill estate. A secure area of wet grassland, barely a few wing flaps from the eastern shore of the wash. This is one of the first times that Curlew in East Anglia will be released into the wild in Norfolk, and hopefully it will restore a population that, like many of the other Curlew populations around the UK, is declining. This project really means um, hope for Curly, for me. I'm really looking forward to seeing the birds release. When you've reared birds in conservation breeding programs, that, that moment of release is just, is just the, the best part. It's just the best feeling when they actually get out there into the wild and start behaving like, like wild birds. Curlews need areas for safe nesting and once they hatch it's the foraging of finding the food and areas where they can hide away from predators that's really, really important. As the birds leave the release pen, they instinctively start foraging for natural food and finding it. And then they try their wings. Thanks very much. And I am now open for questions. Thanks so much, Sam. A really inspiring talk, inspiring presentation and wonderful you were able to include that uh, evocative video there. I think I caught a little snippet of the curlew call during that video. And, you know, that really just reminds us all what's at stake, you know, given the extent of their decline. And so many of us grew up hearing that lovely call ringing out across our, our uplands and farmlands. So, um, yeah, wonderful, wonderful project. We've got lots of questions you won't be surprised to hear. Um, so I'm actually going to start with one that came in on our YouTube channel. We're, we're streaming this to YouTube and Facebook Live as well as over Zoom. Uh, so this is a question from Kay Ounsworth uh, asking, sorry, no, from A.D. Hughes, I apologize. What's the health level of these head-started birds and are they any, any more susceptible 
to illness than um, than wild birds. You, you did show with the kind of crowding effect, perhaps some effect on feather development. But do we know anything about the kind of general health or immune health, that sort of thing of the birds? Yeah, so their um, their physical health is assessed really closely throughout their development at various points by the avicultural team in whatever location really they're being raised in. So having worked with the pen store team, you know, they take the utmost care with their eggs and with their chicks to ensure that they are in good health. Um, you know, they don't go through a really kind of comprehensive screening procedure like, you know, having blood samples and so on taken. But if there's any indication that um, there's any issues with uh, an individual, then a vet is called in and, you know, the bird is assessed and then treated if it's something that is treatable. Um, so it is very closely assessed. But, you know, whether their immune sort of response is as good as wild juveniles, really good question. Time will tell, hopefully. I mean, the fact that you're reciting uh, birds after release is a good indication that they're uh, healthy enough to survive and, and disperse and so on. Um, Kanishka asks, and also there was a supplementary question from, from AD, which was uh, similar. Uh, is there an impact on the parent birds after the eggs are, are removed? And do they ever try to lay a replacement clutch? Yes, they do try and often lay a replacement clutch. So in a natural sort of circumstance, if their eggs were predated either during laying or while, while their parent birds are incubating, um, they would try and uh, normally lay a replacement clutch. They might do that potentially up to three times if depending on when they're sort of the eggs are removed or predated during um, during incubation. Um, in terms of if birds are if nests um, and eggs is, are artificially collected for head starting, then birds will often try and lay a second clutch. And that was kind of the point in the project, certainly for the Norfolk project, where we had so many eggs that we kind of have to say, you know, we're going to start to cause problems for the eggs and the birds that we already have if we collect any more into captivity. Um, so there are more eggs out there. <laughs> Brilliant. Thanks, Sam. Uh, now, there's a few related questions. So um, you know who you are if you've asked one of these, just in relation to pr predation and also predator control. So people curious to know whether, for example, the causes of mortality differ between adults, youngsters, release birds, uh, uh, whether predator control has been trialed and how important predator control is to improving breeding success, I guess, particularly they're thinking in relation to the wild nesting birds rather than the head started ones. Yeah, so predator control is particularly um, crucial for the wild nesting birds. So certainly at the nest stage, which is often um, nests are subject to mammalian predation, but also at the chick stage. Um, and there's sort of potentially effects of different predators throughout um, a chick's life. So in the first week, they might be more susceptible to perhaps mammalian predation, whereas they might, as they get older, they might be more subject to different types of predators, avian predators, for example. It's very difficult to monitor chicks once they fledge and are able to kind of move away from um, the breeding territory. And so what kind of predates um, sort of juveniles in the wild after they fledge is quite a big unknown. So in this case, the radio tags we had on the release juveniles were quite informative at being able to provide some indication of what types of predators to a certain degree might predate juveniles of that size. So, you know, they're fully grown, they're kind of mature in every sense of the word, but they're clearly still vulnerable to predation. In this case, many of our um, predation events were probably avian predators. Thanks, Sam. I'll just ask you one last question, uh, although um, we need to be careful to stick to time. So Frank Morby asks, how are the chicks fed? What are they fed on? And does that have any bearing on their ability to, to forage once they're, they've been released? Yep. So they do get um, sort of food provided for them. Um, I can't remember what it's called exactly, but, you know, the agricultural team will provide them with um, artificial, well, um, sort of artificial food, if you like. Um, but you do see them actually trying to, particularly when they get transferred to the release pen or if they're a, a new set to go into the flight pen, you do see them feeding um, sort of even there on, on wild insects um, that are just, you know, there in the soil and so on. So they do have that natural instinct to feed on live prey for sure. Brilliant. Thanks so much. And sorry to those of you who we didn't manage to get into your questions. Uh, a lot of interest in this. We'll try and pick up on some of those questions and answer them uh, out, outside of the, this part of the session. So thank you again, Sam, for a wonderful, wonderful talk and an inspiring project. Um, and up next, we have uh, more inspiring work, this time from Owen Williams, who's director of the Woodcock Network, and he's going to tell us about a new era in woodcock ringing. So Owen, if you're happy to share your screen and then we'll pass over to you. Okay. That's looking great. That looks great, Owen, well done.
great thank you very much well um first of all just thank you very much for uh, being invited to talk today uh, i must admit i feel like a very small fish in a big pond uh, having seen sam's uh, um, fascinating presentation and a couple of other sessions uh, so i'm very grateful to be invited along to talk today about uh, my work with woodcock um, my background is that I, I grew up um, in, a, in a country environment. I got into a bit of rough shooting as a youngster, and that's really where my interest in woodcock started. And then over the years, um, it, it became a source of inspiration for me as a professional wildlife artist, and many of my paintings uh, and sculptures have been of woodcock as well. And then in recent years, um, around about 2008, um, I approached uh, that uh, that dazzling legend, Tony Cross, who's been mentioned in the previous session, uh, and asked him if he'd be prepared to train me to, uh, to ring woodcock. Um, I'd become aware of a lot of the search that the Game Wildlife Conservation Trust had been doing into the species, uh, and also a lot of work being done in France by uh, their Game and Wildlife Department into the species as well. So this really stoked my sort of fascination uh, for this very understudied bird um, and um, quite sort of mysterious and uh, difficult to monitor. So that's really where the inspiration came from. And um, it might be surprising for a lot to learn that uh, woodcock ringing <clears throat> is actually not a new, uh, a new thing. And in fact, um, I was quite surprised to find that uh, Lord William Percy back in 1891 was the first person uh, to start a really a woodcock ringing scheme or a ringing scheme. I think it was the first in the world because it predates Hans Mortensen by about eight or nine years with his study uh, on starlings. Um, so Lord William Percy was interested to know as they had breeding woodcock there on the home estate at Annick Castle, whether those birds uh, were sedentary or not, whether they migrated away from uh, the castle. And you can see here a rather, a little bit of a gory uh, photograph of the game book from Annick Castle showing um, their database, I suppose you could call it an early version of the uh, of the BTO database, holding details about the rings. Um, as you can see, they chopped the legs off with the rings and wired them onto the game book. Uh, and it's, each one is annotated of uh, uh, details of where it was ringed and where it was shot. Um, the outcome of that was that they discovered that, um, that their woodcock were largely sedentary. Some did move away, uh, but most of them were still on site and shot over successive seasons. So that started our understanding of what happens with our native breeding woodcock. Um, so while that was going on, and, and certainly over uh, the years, uh, around about the time that Lord William Percy was doing his ringing, it caught on amongst some of the big estates in Scotland and also in Northern Ireland where they were doing similar uh, sort of ring, ringing exercises, uh, often making their own rings. Um, their rings weren't specifically numbered. Quite often they had the monogram of the person who owned the estate and the year. So they were looking at cohorts rather than individual birds. Um, and most of these birds, I must emphasize, were pulley that were ringed uh, using um, pointing dogs to locate broods and then catching the birds before they fledged. Uh, and that was very much the case for uh, quite a long time until the 1930s and the start of the BTO. And at that time, the BTO launched their, um, their first uh, significant study, which was the, the Woodcock Inquiry, which was subsequently uh, written up by Alexander uh, and published in, uh, in fact, it was run in 1934 to 35. And that scheme was uh, a questionnaire that went out to a large number of amateur naturalists, but also to estate owners finding out uh, what woodcock they had, uh, inquiring about uh, the number of breeding woodcock, but also about the numbers of wintering woodcock they had turning up. And um, that provided a, a very useful sort of snapshot of the status of the species at that time. Uh, it is quite an important document. Um, the Harry Witherby uh, of the British Birds um, magazine supplied rings for people catching woodcock. Again, these were pulley. Um, and you can see there the, the sort of numbers that were ringed uh, were quite high for a short time, but of course then the war came along and it put a stop to all of that. And then really after the war, there wasn't much time for people working on the land to mess around with catching woodcock. They were more engaged in, uh, in food production uh, due to rationing. Uh, and it was really only in the early 70s when the Game of Wildlife Conservation Trust with Graham Hirons 
uh, who was uh, Andrew Hoodless's predecessor, started doing some studies in Hampshire and Wiltshire on Woodcock, where they were using um, radio tags to monitor movements and uh, generally ringing, but we saw numbers rise again. And then, uh, as I mentioned, I contacted Tony Cross in 2008. I'd been looking at this and thinking that it was a shame that we weren't getting a broader geographical picture of Woodcock and their migration trends and numbers, et cetera. Uh, and that it would be a good idea to mimic something that was already going on in France uh, that was being run over there by the Game of Conservation Trust, um, who were looking at um, uh, engaging um, mostly shooters uh, to go out and put rings on Woodcock. Uh, and it was a pity we couldn't replicate that in the UK. So I set up the Woodcock Network with Tony Cross and a number of other enthusiasts, and we set about um, trying to publicize uh, Woodcock ringing as an activity to the ringing community. And you may have seen some of the articles that have been written uh, in the ringing magazine about that. And you can see the results there um, that saw a, quite a, a rapid increase in the number of people out catching and ringing Woodcock. Uh, and that's now providing quite a significant database for uh, research. Um, so this is just a, a quick snapshot. It's not all of my recoveries. It's not completely up to date, this slide, but it gives you an idea of what we're learning with regards to migration, which is obviously a primary inter interest of the species like this. Um, but you can see there that the general trend in, in migration is very definitely southwestwards from Russia, uh, to Wales and, and Cornwall, but we found with uh, other recoveries uh, and also satellite tagging that we're getting um, a sort of parallel run of migration flight. So from Scandinavia, for example, a lot of those birds fly southwestwards into Scotland and then on into Ireland. Um, further down in Russia, the birds, uh, turn, or the birds turning up in southern England tend to be a little further south in Russia as do the ones in France. So we're seeing that sort of mapping, if you like, that sort of population uh, and, and their, their migration uh, directions. A few little anomalies there, some of these birds um, going on from being ringed in West Wales, where I do my ring to Ireland, one down to Asturias in Northern Spain. Um, but as that picture, picture builds up, we'll get a clearer idea of what's going on. Um, one of the biggest uh, areas of interest for this species uh, is how they cope with uh, severe winter weather. And so um, in 2010, uh, I asked the BTO if I could continue ringing through uh, a very cold period of weather because it was of interest to work out how those birds were coping with cold weather in their winter um, places. And um, this graph really just shows uh, something that is, I suppose, fairly obvious if we have a lot of Cold weather, particularly in the east, quite often we get snow coming in from the east. Um, that cold weather sort of pushing further westwards. Here in the west, we, we're next to the sea, so we get uh, quite often a strip of land which is um, safe from a really severe frost and snow. So it makes a good relocation point for a lot of woodcock. And you can see that effect on this graph. So uh, in 2010, again, in uh, December, you can see there when we had the, the frost and snow, numbers on my sites uh, increased quite dramatically uh, to just below 50 um, on a, a site, which was around about uh, 100 hectares. So quite high numbers turning up. Um, as soon as the thaw came, those numbers um, declined back rapidly to the sort of wintering levels you'd expect. So these birds are relocating back to their usual haunts having escaped the worst of the weather. And it does make sense not to stay around in a overpopulated part of West Wales, where you're having to learn the habitat all you know, anew when you already are familiar with your normal wintering location. One little point of interest on the right of this graph just here is this little uh, peak in number, uh, a numbers on my site, which happens pretty well every year. Uh, and I think that's quite interesting because it suggests that possibly there are birds coming back through the site and building up and using it as a stopover in order to carry on their migration back to the breeding ground in the spring. Um, and actually, uh, here's some ringing data, which sort of verifies uh, that that may well be the case. Um, I think a little bit more analysis of uh, retract data might confirm this, but you can see there 
from those ring numbers and the dates that they were ringed and the dates they were trapped. Bearing in mind that I was working this site very heavily, so uh, over that period I would be out very regularly catching and ringing, none of these birds were encountered between that November and early December ringing date and then uh, around about 13th to the 15th of March, which is the time that they would be moving off on their migration. I think that probably speaks volumes. What is also quite interesting is if you look at these ring numbers, you can see that there are consecutive numbers. And I remember on one particular night uh, catching birds that were consecutive numbers in, in sequence, retrapping them, which was all rather bizarre uh, and got me thinking about what was going on there. So that's quite an interesting insight into uh, the movements uh, of birds driven by cold weather. Uh, and this is a slide showing the average weights um, through a winter. Again, a winter with some quite severe weather. And you can see uh, on the left hand side there uh, at the beginning of November, uh, the birds weights were quite low. Quite often they will be lower than 300 grams when they first arrive having just um, done their migration. Um, it's quite free, you can quite frequently get birds around about 260 grams up to 300 grams. Um, th then you see quite a, a, a sharp climb in weights up to 325 grams um, into the middle of November. And those are birds really packing on their weight, having gone through a bit of starvation, probably on their migration. And this is what I understand is a typical leptin response to starvation, where they really work hard to put weight on. And of course, there is necessity to build up winter energy reserves through uh, up until the, into the new year, into the winter. And in a typical year, you'll see their weights averaging going up uh, towards January. Um, however, there is sometimes this sort of dip back down um, after that sort of active period of feeding, uh, weights then dip back down to uh, just where that the, where the mild sign is there. Um, and that often happens after a period of rapid feeding. They then sort of, they almost overdo it and then have to settle back down to their sort of more near their average. You can see then just moving across, there's a little, little bit of a blip with frost there for a, uh, a few nights that um, seem to put the weight down a little bit. And then you see when the snow came in, how their weights dropped very significantly. Um, again, when the thaw came, you can see how those winter, those average weights shot up again. Again, I suspect this is a leptin response to starvation. Um, I was witnessing birds that normally when you're out uh, ringing at night, you'll see birds actively feeding for an hour and a half uh, after they arrive on the fields uh, at, at dusk. Um, on those nights, I was seeing birds active way up until midnight. So they were really working hard to get that weight back. And that makes sense, not only just to have an energy reserve, but a lot of the uh, fat that's been seen on dissected woodcock um, have been around the vital organs. So this offers a very valuable insulation against uh, frost and cold weather. And then um, the, 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 uh, the weights then drop down. Interestingly, uh, every year you see quite a drop in weight just prior to them putting weight on again uh, pre-migration. Um, I suspect that may be something to do with burning up um, weight on different parts of the body before they lay a new weight in, a new fat in to service the flight muscles. So maybe there's, a, there's something going on there, but that's, I'm not sure about that, just my own theory at the moment. Um, so the um, research, uh, uh, what happened with uh, a, a lot of the data that I collected um, was that Game Wildlife Conservation Trust uh, published a paper, as you can see here, which was looking at how woodcock regulate their body energy reserves. Uh, and as the title says, an implication for cold weather shooting restrictions. Um, the key findings of uh, the study that was done, which um, had, I think, 2,116 um, um, data from 2,116 uh, ringed birds, but also uh, I think just over 200 uh, birds were also dissected to have a look at their, their fat reserves, etc. So a fairly comprehensive study of their energy reserves. And you can see here that um, we've also worked out that uh, woodcock find it hard to feed if the uh, minimum temperatures are below two, uh, two and a half degrees C. Uh, at minimum temperatures below five, then uh, 
woodcock feeding is difficult both day and night because there's no time for thawing out in the daytime. And energy reserves in a severe frost are sufficient for about six days. Uh, and that will give them about an 860 kilometer uh, potential for escape um, from cold weather. But of course, here in West Wales, um, they could go to Ireland, but there's not many options left for them to go and get away from cold weather. Um, so there are some serious uh, considerations that come out of this research. Uh, and one of the beauties and why I'm quite keen on being involved in this is how we can communicate this to the shooting community, uh, which is something that I'm active in doing in writing articles. But the policy considerations for this are that we think that um, there should be a, a cessation of woodcock shooting in region, regions where there's been four days of permanently frozen ground. Um, and that is um, not the case at the moment. So woodcock uh, are also grouped in with wildfowl that have a seven day voluntary restraint and then a statutory restraint after 14 days. But clearly what we've discovered in this research is that woodcock don't have that much reserve. And also they don't have the facility to escape cold weather by going onto the um, estuaries where mallard and um, ducks and geese can find uh, adequate food to sustain them through difficult times. Woodcock don't have that option. So the recommendations really are that we should reconsider um, including um, woodcock in uh, along, alongside wildfowl uh, in that respect. Um, but also a protection order should remain uh, for seven days following a thaw. Certainly woodcock are capable of putting on uh, a lot of weight very quickly after a thaw as we've seen from those grass, but seven days ensures that they have adequate time to restore their body condition. And then finally, uh, there should be a consideration of imposing a, a total shooting ban uh, after more than two bit, uh, periods of severe cold uh, in one winter. And I think that makes uh, a lot of sense. As I say, I, I'm involved in this because I sit on this rather uncomfortable fence between the shooting community uh, and conservationists and, and ringers. Um, and, but I, my belief is that uh, we should be looking towards sustainability if we're shooting. I'm quite sure there'll be some questions coming up later on about shooting woodcock. Um, and that's a, a complex issue. Um, so I just move on now to retrapping. And the other information that we get, of course, from ringing is that we get quite a lot of retrap. So this is just a slide showing uh, a woodcock that um, I ringed there. You can see the, the red marker showing that was ringed in 2009. Uh, it didn't come back as far as I know onto the site for a couple of years, but then 2011, it turned up um, in the autumn. Uh, and again in 2000 and, uh, um, 14, it arrived, uh, it was there for 2014 in January and also again later. So it came back on migration again in 2014 in the autumn. So this is showing us uh, wintering site fidelity. Uh, I've ringed around about 2,400 woodcock on sites around um, a place near Aberystwyth, a number of farms that I've been doing my study. Uh, and that level of ringing has really revealed uh, quite a high level of wintering site fidelity. So this is a graph demonstrating that, uh, and this is a percentage of the adults uh, that I catch each winter, and the percentage of those that have been ringed on previous winters who have been retrapped, uh, ring birds being retrapped. You can see there in 2008, um, 2009, 2010, uh, as I hadn't done previous work on the site, then uh, obviously we weren't, weren't getting high numbers of retraps. But by the time we get to about 2011, we can see that uh, uh, the, that, that level has gone up. And so taking it roughly from that, that point onwards, we're looking at a sort of mean of around about 46% of all the adults I catch on my site uh, have been ringed on previous winters. Um, interesting, in 2016, that went up. So although we see quite a high level of wintering site fidelity in Woodcock, some of the evidence we're getting from the satellite tags and the geolocated data that we're getting back indicate that some of these birds uh, don't come all the way to the UK and may hang on uh, in the Netherlands or on the continent and only get pushed to us if they have cold weather over there. And I think that was a case in 2016 that really bumped up my uh, my retrap of previously ringed birds uh, in that year. 
interesting to see in next year, it dropped down significantly. And that might be something to do with the very cold weather and that extra migration having a high mortality impact um, on them that was reflected in the retraps the following year. That's not 100% um, sure, but it might indicate that. So that uh, level of uh, retrap uh, and wintering site fidelity, I think is quite significant. And again, I write articles in the shooting press um, about these factors, um, impressing people that if you shoot on a site where you've got clearly high wintering site fidelity, you're going to impact that if you overshoot. So the approach there is to caution restraint. Uh, and we do that also when we uh, get information from the breeding grounds in Russia about poor breeding um, uh, success on the breeding grounds in any given year. Um, Andrew Hoodless of GWCT and myself uh, will issue a notice that goes out to the shooting press to, um, to suggest that people uh, exercise caution on those winters. So this is a part of uh, a, a bigger group. So over the years, uh, other countries have joined in. France were very much the pioneers for woodcock ringing uh, and uh, doing, doing studies. Um, UK got heavily involved in that as well. Uh, and now we've got uh, a lot of other countries who are doing a lot of research, uh, a lot of satellite tagging, geolocator work, uh, trying to learn a bit more about uh, the species across its range as far as possible. And um, every four years, there is a, 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 a seminar that we all turn up to. Uh, this one was in St. Petersburg a few years ago, uh, where we present papers on the species, just for woodcock and also for snipe, um, sharing information, sharing knowledge, uh, and uh, just um, information flow and communication is quite useful to get the broader picture. Uh, and I also am quite active in doing that through our Facebook uh, page where we share information with other people. Um, I was very lucky to be contacted by uh, a, a bird ringer in Japan who wanted to get into woodcock ringing and asked me about technique and so I sent him the details uh, and he is now starting ringing woodcock uh, over there, the very same species as we ring here except of course they migrate in a different direction over there. Uh, he came over to visit me and we went out woodcock ringing here in Wales so that was quite a big moment. So that sort of sharing information is really uh, very very valuable. Um, so I, this is just an example of a, an article that was published re recently in a shooting magazine where I'm laying out the details of what we've learned so far and the importance of understanding this with regards to sustainability. So I think that's just about it. Thank you very much for um, uh, allowing me to speak and I'm ready for some questions. Thanks so much, Erin. A lovely photo there to end with of a, of a bird being released. And, and the fact that it's um, nighttime there does tie in with a question that we've had from a few people now. Who was it? Uh, Howard Langton and Paul all asking if you could just explain how you go about catching the birds for ringing. Yeah, that's a, a, a good example. I could have gone into more detail, but time wouldn't allow it. Um, dazzling, uh, it, it's dazzle and net is the technique we use. Um, and so we're using lamps, um, a torch, uh, and uh, a, a long handle net with a telescopic three meter pole um, and a sort of carp net um, that, uh, and the technique is uh, to spot the eye shine. Mainly what I tend to do is to look down the beam of the lamp you can then see the eye shining back, the reflection. Uh, you can then walk in and it's usually around about 10, 10 to 50 meters away. They then become aware of you, a little bit of noise, perhaps you know, footsteps coming towards them, they get slightly more wary. And after that point, you have to be very stealthy and sneak in them and then drop the net on them. If you're getting 50%, you're doing quite well. There are some nights very frustrating. Uh, I was out the other night and I caught nine birds that I'd seen in total well over 40 so it was one of those frustrating nights where they were all jumping it was also exacerbated because we had groups of twos and threes sitting close together so when you're trying to pick one of those out the others outside the lamp are not dazzled and they'll take the other birds away but there are people these days using um uh, the, the infrared um uh kit to to spot birds um i've not gone that far i'm a bit of an old dinosaur now with my old, old lamp i carry on using the old kit that i've always used well, it's working, isn't it? If you've ringed 2,400, it's uh, 
obviously a technique that works. So um, you, you sort of slightly preempted this uh, question with one of your your comments around the sort of slight um, sensitivity around shooting woodcock, and you know sh shooting is always an emotive subject. Uh, we've got um, essentially questions from Rebecca, Carrie, and Sean, just asking for your thoughts really on uh, you know whether shooting should continue given that woodcock are uh, you know, on, on the birds of conservation concern list. So you no doubt got some thoughts on that. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Um, I, I completely understand where people are coming from uh, uh, with regards to this. However, I think there's some context to be applied to it. Um, I think that, first of all, they're on the red list in the UK. So that's specifically applied to our UK breeding population. Uh, the IUCN recognised uh, woodcock uh, on its um, total range as being of least concern. And certainly there's good evidence that uh, that population is very stable and is not being impacted by shooting. However, it's fair to question whether shooting in the UK is an issue uh, for our resident population. Um, I, I, there are a couple of points there. I think that um, there has been some research done by Chris Heywood. He published a paper recently uh, that's of the GWCT who looked into the key drivers that were pushing this decline. I think, first of all, if we look at the historic context of this, the woodcock in the UK are on the very western fringe of a very large breeding range that run all the way from here right across to Vladivostok, that whole boreal forest. And I've been there and seen the habitat. It's not touched by man. There's a bit of um, logging and stuff going on in some places where it's commercially viable, but it's a very robust uh, and very safe um, breeding range. But on the west here, um, I think the key uh, pointer is the fact that Woodcock have never bred very successfully in Cornwall, Devon, on the western fringes, on the southwestern fringes of the UK. And although there's not a lot of research done on this, I would argue that that's probably because we have very uh, wet and cold springs and climate change will see this flux back and forth with those conditions and so when we get um, in, apart from the last couple of springs where we've had quite uh, dry and warm early spring the general trend has been to be colder and wetter and that of course um, hampers brood survival and will reduce uh, breeding success the other factors are things like woodland management so coppicing and things like that are now in massive de decline. Hopkins and Kirby wrote a very interesting paper in 2007 looking at the management of woodland. And it's astonishing to see the decline in woodland management. However, I would say that the, some of the, the, the best woodland management is now being conducted on shoots where they've got an interest in creating a, a good understory for game birds. Uh, and that certainly benefits Woodcock. And GWCT have been very heavily involved in advising people on how to manage their woods for good breeding woodcock as well. So it, it's not a, a black and white picture about uh, shooting. And my belief is that I think if we, if, if we did stop shooting, I don't think we would see uh, the, or have much, if any, influence on that decline uh, that we've witnessed in the UK over recent years, because I think there are some much, much bigger drivers uh, at play here. Thanks, Anna. That's a really good and well-considered uh, response there. Uh, Joanne asking a supplementary question on, on the shooting subject. Again, just curious to know whether um, they're shot for food or for sport. No, they are shot, they're shot for food. Um, I, I don't know anybody who shoots a woodcock and then just you know, chucks it in the hedge. Um, I, that, that is, um, that is, you know, I'm absolutely guaranteed on that one. Uh, I, I've, I've shot all my life and know a lot of people who shoot the the one of the motivators is that they are actually very tasty um and so I, I, it would be ludicrous for somebody to shoot a woodcock and actually a lot of the woodcock shooting is done by people who go out uh with a dog and a gun and do walked up woodcock shooting in dense thick woodland like we get here in west wales it's a really hard work uh, and when you come back and you want a good meal and to have a nice bottle of claret and a brace of woodcock to enjoy i know it sounds an alien thing for most of your audience but it's a very pleasurable thing and it's sustainable and quite a wholesome exercise as far as i can see thanks Owen. and uh, you know i think as we said at the start of the question said that these are always emotive subjects um, and I think people will really appreciate you giving your views on that and giving some really well considered responses there so thank you again for that and thank you for a really uh, excellent inspiring talk and good luck on those cold nights out there with your torch and your your net on a pole and I hope I wish you luck for a good catch success.
So thanks, thanks again. Thank you. So we're on to our final talk of uh, this afternoon's session. Uh, and we're moving on uh, from one wader to another and to Richard Defoe, who is a passionate ringer in the Northwest, uh, or at least has been ringing not in the Northwest, and is going to tell us about the amazing things that they've learned from colour ringing knot uh, in, in, in various parts of the Northwest. So over to you, Richard. OK, uh, hopefully the slides have appeared. No, the slides, the slides haven't just yet. Uh, so we've, we've, right. got, we've got you, but not your slides yet. The day job letting me down. How's that? Yeah, that's good. We've got you. Brilliant. Right. Uh, why not? Well, when I had an email from Ruth asking me to present, I said, why not? And I'd never thought of a better title, so I stuck with that. Anyway, um, a few years ago, we were approached by a couple of people who read a lot of colour rings to, uh, to start ringing some knots. And there are a few things I was keen to make sure we all agreed on. The first is we'd get a reasonable number of recitings, otherwise it would be a waste of time. And I'm just going to have to ignore the doorbell, so sorry about that. Um, anyway, uh, the Northwest has a really nice population of knot that uh, were completely unmarked, were largely unmarked. So we knew very little about them. I'll start, I'll start off with my interests to start off with. Um, Ringing for me is all about what birds normally do, uh, not what the rare bird rarely does. So I'm going to start off with a bird that did something really unusual. And it's actually the first knot I ever handled in 1999 when I was on the wash mist netting. And one night we caught three knots. And this one, uh, it, it's not a great photo. Uh, I wouldn't recommend that grip at all. On but uh, this bird was ringed above the knee and Luckily, I checked it, and by the time I'd read Buda on the address, it was in someone else's hand. And it turns out this juvenile knot was ringed 10 days before somewhere in Hungary, and it had reorientated successfully to the wash and survived, which is quite a remarkable journey for a bird that uh, was probably only out the egg for four months. So that, that got me hooked, and then the more I learned about them, the more I learned they were globally exceptionally well studied. So of the six races of knots in the world, uh, all of them have people working on them to a greater or lesser extent. Perhaps the most famous population are the Rufa red knot in America. Um, this one is in Delaware Bay, where there's a long-term colouring project, which started in the 90s when there was a very, very rapid decline of them following over harvesting of horseshoe crabs, which then led to about an 80 to 90 percent decline in their population in very short order over a matter of a few years. Um, and again, in Australia, New Zealand, Europe, uh, they're all very well monitored. So that was great. And the other great thing about knot is they're easily accessible in a lot of places. So here is just about five kilometers from my house uh, with a flock of, it's quite hard to see here, but it's about 2,000 knots sitting on a rock wall, uh, about 100, well, 80 meters out, so well within telescope reading range. So on a good day when, when the birds are there, I can go along and read 10 or a dozen color rings in not very long. The nice thing about the Northwest is the big spring tides are normally about lunchtime. So I can escape from work for an hour or two and uh, have a really nice uh, hour getting some data. So that's, that's what started me off on knot. Uh, quick recap on, on the different subspecies. There's an excellent page on Wikipedia, which this is lifted from. Uh, I did try and describe them, but that, that was too complicated. The, the birds we get here in winter are of the Icelandica race. Now, um, these typically molt in either mainland Europe or the wash and then over winter move west and then um, in the breeding season head up to Greenland and Canada to breed and their range is very close to the red knot where they breed and genetically they are very closely related to the red knot as well. But the Rufa red knot also migrate a long way in a different direction. So they may go 14,000 kilometers 
on a long migration. Uh, they'll stage in a couple of places, but they're shorter distance ones. And you go about 5,000 kilometers, which is roughly the same as what ours do. Uh, the Canutus knot, which also pass through the UK in smaller numbers, breed in the high Arctic again and spend the winter in Western Africa. And they're really well studied, studied by uh, NEOS and Global Flyway Network. There's a brilliant paper that they uh, published about four years ago. And they highlight how important species like knot are for global monitoring of climate health. So the commuters not are arriving in the Arctic at the same time, but their food supply is hatching earlier. So the insects are flying earlier and they're missing the peak with the chicks. So the chicks aren't growing as well. And so when they leave, their bill lengths aren't as big, uh, which if everything was equal, that probably wouldn't be a problem. Apart from when they get to West Africa, uh, because of climate change, it's that bit hotter. And their food source, when it's hot, goes that bit deeper. And because they've gone deeper and the birds have a shorter bill, they can't reach them. So they're being hit twice by climate change. But I think with a lot of these waders, there's so much to be learned about what's going on in remote, impossible to survey places by collecting data in easy to work places. <coughs> So for the, the next slide or two, it's quite important to know the life cycle of a knot. Um, clutches are normally four eggs. Uh, and these are laid in the high Arctic as the snow melts. The incubation is shared. And using uh, technology like geolocators, we can see that the incubation is about 12 hours on, 12 hours off. Um, so there's loads of traces, uh, daylight traces from geolocators, which show brilliantly how the incubation is shared. And trying to do that on the ground is impossible. Well, it's very hard work with the low density. However, with remote sensing technologies, we can do that without, uh, without going to the Arctic. Anyway, the, the kind of amazing thing about knot is, and many other small waders, is soon after the eggs hatch, the females leave, go to molt in Western Europe. And a few weeks later, just as the chicks are fledging, the males also leave, uh, which leaves the chicks to uh, end for themselves and migrate on their own without any major parental steer. <coughs> Excuse me. So the adults will molt um, back in the UK, um, Western Europe. Uh, and that, that's from sort of July to October. And the chicks will start to arrive a bit later. And some years, they'll all the juveniles will appear on some estuaries and not others. So this year, there's a lot on the wash, but very few on the northwest. In the northwest, uh, quite a few, few years, they're well spread. And some years, there's total failure. Now, it gets a bit complicated here. Um, after the adults have completed molt, some will migrate to their wintering grounds and others will winter where they've molted. So there's a shift in about uh, early November. And then over winter, things are fairly static, but when it comes to March, some birds will migrate back east and others will molt into their summer plumage where they wintered, and then they'll all head north, either by, by North Norway or Iceland, uh, up to their breeding grounds. Now, the second year birds, like many waders, don't uh, breed. So they head off to what I'm calling traditional second year sites. So the northwest of the UK has typically housed about 5,000 knots each summer. Uh, and in, in that summer, they molt and uh, wait until the other adults are back and then disperse to where they're going to winter. Uh, and after that, they behave just like adults. So um, another thing that I'm going to come on to later, which is important, is not like many, many birds are sexually dimorphic. And with many waders, the female is the larger of the two. Um, as you can see from the data, there's a huge amount of overlap as well. So the, these are just birds we've caught in the Northwest in 2017, 2018. Uh, one of the outliers was later found in Africa, so I think that was a different race. Uh, but if you catch a bird and measure it, you cannot 
with much confidence say whether it's a male or female on biometrics. But what you can do from a cohort that you've caught is say 60 or 70 percent of these are male or female from biometrics and assign that group uh, as to uh, roughly the sex split in them. Now, um, why did we start colour marking them? Uh, Peter Knight and Rose, uh, Rose spent a lot of time uh, reading colour rings in the Northwest, and they found that in autumn and spring, there were very few marked birds, but in winter there are a lot, uh, which had mostly come from Norway and Holland. And there was this big gap in, in birds in spring and autumn that we just didn't know what they were doing. We had a hunch they mostly went through Iceland, but we had not all that much evidence. So uh, once we'd agreed that we would get the sightings from them, we made two catches in uh, the autumn and spring of 2017-18. And we marked a total of a thousand birds around then, which I was hoping we may get 10, 15 sightings a week from. Uh, within a day or two, and um, well, in fact, it was 16 hours from releasing the first bird, last bird of that catch, to having the first batch of birds seen 20 kilometres away, uh, feeding on the intertidal. So very quickly, we had a lot of sightings. And we continued at about a rate of, on average, 10 sightings a day for the first year, which I, I was astounded by. Uh, and so far, we've had just over 10,000 sightings in 10 different countries. The other amazing bit of this is we've had now two and a half thousand records of individuals less than 60 days apart at different sites. So that's giving us a great insight into their movements on quite a short time scale. Obviously not as good as a satellite tag or radio tag, but it does give us a great resolution of data that we just could not get with um, conventional, conventional ringing. Uh, the map on the right shows the kind of key areas in the northwest. Altcar and Ainsdale, the yellow pins are where we've ringed a lot of birds. The D, Ribble and Morecambe Bay are where we get a lot of sightings. We also get a lot of sightings in Wales, uh, Wales and Ireland, mostly Iceland, uh, Ireland. <coughs> and the one thing that I'm a bit sad about is out of all the 10,000 sightings, we're yet to get one on the breeding grounds. But when the density of them is so, so low in, in uh, Canada, and it's so hard to work, it's probably not too surprising. Right, a uh, quick summary of what we've found. Um, this is a classic example of ringing birds tells you exactly what you expect with the odd surprise thrown in. So birds that uh, stage in the northwest, molt in the northwest uh, in autumn and spring, generally go via Iceland to their breeding grounds. So we've now had over 100 individuals. It's over 10% of the birds we've marked in the northwest have been seen on their migration. 98% of those have been seen in Iceland and just 2% in Norway. Whereas if we took um, birds marked in Holland on the Wadden Sea, we'd find there was a much greater proportion going by in Norway. Uh, which is, this is probably no surprise, as why would you go from the northwest of the UK to Norway and then on to Canada when Iceland is a great place to stop over? And um, one of the interesting things about Iceland is with climate changing a bit, it's now viable for them to grow some uh, uh, barley in, in the coastal fields. And a lot of the knots are now feeding up in the wheat and barley fields on the coast, um, upsetting the farmers quite a bit, uh, but they are fattening up very quickly for their onward migration. <clears throat> Uh, one interesting bird I will mention is this uh, V3, which was photographed by um, Howard Stockdale, a local photographer and keen colouring reader uh, up at Heesham. So that, again, is five, six kilometres from where I live in Lancaster. And it's regularly seen in Morecambe Bay, up at Leighton Moss in spring, 
and also on the Dee and Sefton coasts. And it commutes between these sites on a regular basis and is seen often. And so within a series of tides over a month period or two week period, it is quite often using these sites 80 kilometers apart, which I find amazing. And surveys like Webb's are absolutely brilliant uh, and provide great data about estuaries. But without addition of these short term movements, we cannot build up an, a, a brilliant picture of what's going on. So all the surveys the BTO do and we're all involved in all tie in very well into an integrated uh, monitoring solution. And we need to be sure that every survey is looked after and, uh, and all the different data sources are used to their best effect. <clears throat> the second bird I'm going to talk about, um, this is another bird that does, did something I didn't expect. Uh, it was photographed in the Azores, 2N, uh, clearly in very poor condition one September. And over about the period of a month, we got quite a few photos of it looking worse and worse and worse. I thought, well, this is another lo lost bird we'll never hear of again. Uh, and my view of a lot of these lost birds was they'd never reorientate. But uh, surprisingly, the following year, after it disappeared from the Azores, uh, it turned up back on its wintering grounds on the Sefton coast. Uh, so that is yet another example of, um, of lost birds in the wrong place. You know, a bird doing a rare thing that they shouldn't do, uh, successfully surviving, which was a great record. And it's probably why there's so many different races of knot, because they are so good at getting lost. And um, they, they quite often form wintering sites, uh, sorry, yeah, form a new preferred wintering area. Uh, in the 1960s, there was a group of the Canutus knot that managed to find its juveniles that found its way to South Africa, about 500 of them. And over the next 10, 15 years, the numbers gradually re uh, reduced, but they formed a new short term wintering ground that they went back to later, uh, many years later. So in a very similar way to how curly sandpipers will suddenly appear somewhere different and that population will survive for a few years and gradually reduce as it gets older, uh, not are also quite good at doing the same thing. Now, one thing um, I quite like about the, the number of sightings we get is we can do some fairly interesting things with the data. And 2018, autumn of 2018 was the first year when we had arrival dates of birds from the Arctic. And it was the first year, so we weren't quite sure what to expect. And in late July, the first sightings of birds came back. And Rose, who'd, who'd been uh, reading the colourings on them, had found that the first cohort to arrive on average was quite big. And um, this uh, implied they were females because of the dimorphism. And about the same time, there was this tweet from your own Renekins, who does some brilliant work in the Arctic. And he was highlighting the um, very, very cold weather in Greenland that had caused failure of wader breeding in Greenland. Um, this has been widely reported since in uh, journals like Nature that Greenland, it was a complete disaster. And this, this, kind, this story kind of grew as more people heard about it. But that autumn, I was talking to birders on the coast and they were saying, oh, we're not expecting to see any juveniles. And very quickly, the story had built up that this failure in Greenland was actually a failure across the Arctic. Um, the data we were seeing as time went on was more and more smaller birds were returning suggested to us more males were returning later, uh, which indicated that the females had left when the chick eggs had hatched and the males had stayed a bit longer. Uh, so we thought there was going to be quite a lot of juveniles appearing. And as this story kept growing uh, from more and more people extrapolating one data point, uh, you know, the narrative became there'll be no juveniles. And suddenly juvenile knots and sandling appeared from nowhere well, appeared from not Eastern Greenland. 
Um, so that, that was a great start for us because we, we knew we were collecting data that could show us what was going on uh, in a place that was very hard to work. Now, Jeroen has an excellent Twitter feed and um, Global Flyway Network have a brilliant website that tells a great story about what's going on. And they're also always after more data about juvenile sandling ratios. So if you're out on the coast looking at birds, it's well worth looking at juvenile and adult ratios of sandling because Jeroen is always keen to have more data. The second thing I'm going to talk about is the amazing numbers of knots that turned up on uh, the East Coast last year. Um, this was widely covered by Autumn Watch. And just a couple of weeks ago, uh, they did mention that last year was an exceptional year. This might be a good thing for how well knots are doing, which is a bit surprising as, as a general rule for Arctic breeding waders, the rate that their population can increase is quite slow, whereas the rate it can fall is very fast because they're fairly low productivity. They're long lived. And so they're only ever going to produce four chicks in a really good year. And it's never going to be all of them that succeed. So this sudden 20, 30% increase in numbers was a surprise. Uh, and again, this has been widely reported as this is great for not. But talking to some friends at NEOS and Global Flyway Network last year, it became apparent they had a really hot period in some neat tides in summer. And what this did was cut to the surface of the mud and drove the shellfish either downwards deeper into the mud or caused them to die, which then meant there was no available food for the knot to feed on. And not when they run out of food, have a choice of either dying or moving. So they uh, moved and the wash was the first place to come. they came to. Unfortunately, the, not, the wash is very challenging to read colourings on because the mud is quite soft, that the bird, so the birds sink in and it's quite hard to read them. Or when they come into a roost like at Snettisham, they're in so densely as uh, Les Bunyan's excellent photo shows, you just cannot see any legs. So trying to monitor them on the wash is very difficult. This is a real shame because it's made it very hard for us to prove exactly whether it was individual birds changing place or whether it was something else going on. So as Owen was talking a lot about cold weather movements of woodcock, this is quite widely known in a lot of waterfowl. They move when it's very cold because they're frozen out. Maybe in the future, we should be looking at hot weather movements caused by food on availability from it being uh, affected by climate change. Ah, right, the future. Um, th this May, we, uh, we caught some second year birds. These are, are ones that we really do not understand. Um, in the entire history, of the ringing scheme of not. Uh, again, Owen referred to the very long-term data set for woodcock starting in the early 1900s. Not in the UK only started in 1938 when the first one was ringed. And it took until about 1959 for the first hundred to be marked. Uh, so, you know, not ringing in the UK is quite new. Um, in the history of the ringing scheme, we've only had 25 second year not marked in May ever recovered until this year. And the bulk of these have done very odd things. Some have uh, been up in May, uh, sorry, up in Iceland in May, and then come on to different wintering grounds. Uh, some were caught in Morecambe Bay and have then wintered elsewhere. So, so they're doing things very differently to the adults that we catch normally. Um, of the 250 we colour marked, most of them stayed on the Sefton coast until late August and then suddenly disappeared. Uh, up until two weeks ago, we had nine in Dublin Bay, and I was over there 10 days ago and had a great week reading colour rings. In five days, I think I, I saw about 200 different colour ringed birds. And if you're ever after a fairly local birding holiday, I can recommend Dublin Bay. It's just utterly amazing. 
Um, quite a few have come up to Morecambe Bay. One, two have gone over to the East Coast, which is probably what we'd expect. And one went up to Scotland fairly soon afterwards. We're really looking forward to where finding out where these go, as we think they will behave significantly different, differently to the adults we normally catch. Um, there's a lot of things I want to do in the future. Uh, the main one is continue it, it marking a kind of small number each year so that we can have a long-term data set as many research projects last as long as the funding. So this is uh, largely funded by um, private sources rather than from grants. I'm optimistic we can keep this going for a long time. And long-term data sets is what we need, not, um, not a two-year kind of research project that uh, stops after it. Uh, <coughs> so I thought I'd look at what's happened in the last 10 years with ringing of not, and the numbers have remained fairly stable, the blue line, what's been ringed, but the re-encounters, without the colour ringing that's started, expanded to the wash and the bits in Wales, we were only getting about 50 to 100 re-encounters of knots in the UK a year. And since we've started colour ringing and had some really good observers being out a lot, we've increased the number of re-encounters from about 50 to 100 a year to about 2,000. I think this year is going to be quite a good year when all the data are entered. Uh, there's a few things people I, I really need to thank. Uh, the photographers, basically the bad photos were mine and the good photos came from Gav, uh, Howard, Les and Phil Woolen. There's some of observers who've produced vast numbers of data, uh, ob ob the vast numbers of observations. So Rose and Peter and Richard Smith. I'm sure if, if you've seen a colour ring Godwit anywhere, Richard Smith's name will be on it somewhere. Um, and we've now had about 150 different people see colouring knots and report them. And that's really important when, when you do see a colouring bird as it just adds that little bit more to our understanding each time. The um, Army Alcar Rangers have been fantastic in helping us out, uh, giving us permission and not shooting on days when we're shoot, uh, catching and Sefton Council as well for permission at Ainsdale. South West Lanx Ringing Group have really helped us out, um, been excellent working with them. Jim, Rose and Peter, without them, this project would never have started. Well, it's really an expansion of their work in Iceland and Norway. Uh, so without their efforts, it wouldn't have happened. And the most important people are what surveyors affectionately known as know as the zero heroes who go out look look for birds and put the hours in but do not find and they're just as important as uh, the people who go out and find birds but these zero counts and zero records are really important to understanding what's going on so thank you very much and keep the sightings coming in Thank you so much, Richard. Another really interesting, stimulating talk. And thank you for reminding us all how the various different ways in which we contribute kind of fit into the, the puzzle through the Wetland Bird Survey um, webs and, and the ringing re sightings and so on. But, uh, you know, re really reinforcing there with your talk uh, just how much our ringers do uh, through their passion and dedication and expertise to advance understanding of, uh, of, of some species in, in the case of your talk not, and, and obviously Owen telling us about Woodcock. Um, very, very lucky to have you um, putting your uh, dedication and expertise to good uh, good use. We've got uh, a few questions that have come in. Uh, the first from Kay Ounsworth on our Facebook live stream. She was interested by the knot movements you'd observed locally, you know, uh, relatively short distance movements, but over small time periods. I think you said 80 kilometres between estuaries and she's wondering whether that was due to uh, changes in the the tide you know optimizing their arrival to coincide with the optimal state of tide or could it be relating to um, the availability of food at the different sites yeah. um, yes so um, just last week we had some some sightings come in where the birds have moved 20 kilometers from their feeding grounds up on the D to their roost sites um, I, I think 
certainly a lot of these are moving the longer distance movements are because um on a bigger tide there's probably more food availability in Morecambe Bay when the tides dropped further uh but I'm, I'm not sure it's not clear but it's certainly going to be food availability um and low disturbance as well will play a part in it Okay, thank you. A uh, question from Hilary McBean. Uh, she, like me, was struck by your map you showed of the distributions and, and breeding and wintering grounds of the five subspecies. I think there were subspecies you said. And uh, she was curious to know about the extent to which they, they mix over the top, you know, in the, in the Arctic. And, and what is it that maintains the different subspecies? Uh, that, I don't know, I'm afraid. There, there's probably some mixing between Rufa and Icelandica, so the, the two breeding in um, Canada. But after that, I think they are fairly separate. There's perhaps a bit of the two races that um, winter in Australia, so breed Alaska and um, Russia. But uh, I'm afraid I don't know. Okay, thank you. Uh, question from Langton about um, apparent absence of sightings from the Thames Estuary or Swale, uh, I, th I think maybe in reference to um, some of your reciting maps, perhaps. But any, any thoughts on? Uh... Um, well, uh, yes. Uh, the reason um, they're not there for us at the moment is not because of lack of not or lack of observers. It's just the ones we mark in winter uh, generally don't go much further south than. Um, than Morecambe Bay, the Ribble. Uh, a lot of the Dutch birds, which uh, Neos colour mark, it do turn up on the Thames estuary. So I think Ed Keeble is always looking out for colouring birds and has large amounts of data. And he gets a lot of Norwegian birds as well. But as I, I think I'm counting him almost as a zero hero in this case, because he's certainly been looking for our birds and hasn't found them. Well, de definitely highlighting, as you, you did in your talk as well, the value of folk going out with their binoculars, with their scopes and looking and, and reciting and, and reporting their sightings, uh, uh, clearly contributing to this uh, wonderful research. So thank you again for your talk and thank you again to all three of our speakers for uh, excellent, uh, enjoyable talks and contributing to the programme. Um, just before we go, just a reminder, as I said at the start, that uh, your support as uh, as members, as volunteers, uh, and uh, as funding supporters of our work is really, really valued and important. Uh, so if you've enjoyed the talks, if you're enjoying the program, um, please do support us if you can. I know it's a difficult time for many of us, but um, if you can support us with the donation, we would really, really appreciate it. Uh, next up tomorrow, we have a session uh, on uh, all sorts of fantastic advances in technology. So we've got a talk on tree pipits, one on night jars and one on the tagging of migrant passerines. And that's another 2 p.m. session tomorrow. So hopefully you can join us uh, for that. But uh, all that remains to say now is thank you again for, for coming. I hope you've enjoyed it uh, and uh, see you on another session before too long. Bye for now. Thank you, Ben.